I'm a biology faculty member and I'm the coordinator of the public health program here at Rod Williams. And I'm very glad to see you here today for the first of the panel. We have quite a diverse group of panelists uh, that are uh, going to be talking to you about uh, either their career and some opportunities or some opportunities, uh, some programs that they're representing. So, so you'll have a chance to hear about to meet them and their programs, learn a little bit about the panel, and have some question and answer afterwards. So I, uh, uh, I think what I'll do first, we, we have, um, like I said, we, we have a, a, a group of panelists, but we have a special panelist, Sam, who is, sorry, you're all special. <laughs> But she is, she's um, an alumna, and she graduated five years ago. And so what I thought would be nice to me is Sam sort of all told you a little bit about what she's doing now, but talked about experiences at Robin Williams and what set her up well and really prepared her for this. So I'm going to shut the door. We'll do that. I think that'll, that'll be better. Okay, so Sam Kaleska? Yes. Uh, formerly Sam Taylor, and um, uh, at Genzyme now. Uh, so maybe tell us about your path. Yeah, so I started out coming to Roger Williams as actually a marine bio major. Um, did that for my fr freshman and half of my sophomore year, and then I decided I wanted to switch over to biology. Um, so I started majoring in biology, and so it was pretty similar, so it wasn't a huge change. Um, and I also really enjoyed organic chem for some reason. <laughs> it was great. But that um, drove me to also be a chemistry major as I progressed through um, sophomore and junior year. So I, uh, so I was kind of going to end up with, with biology and chemistry as my degree. And then as I was here, I really liked my genetics class and I started talking with Marcy a lot. And um, after my sophomore year, I actually started doing research outside of class with her. So over the summer, I would stay here and do research on marine viruses, which I found was probably the best thing I could do just because it gave me that hands-on experience it taught me how to really think critically in the lab and try to solve problems other than just in a textbook or um, in classroom lab. It was a completely different experience. And also it allowed me to go to uh, conferences where I could present my research. So I was able to learn how to talk to other people in different fields about science, which was, it can be challenging. Um, so that's kind of my experience here. And then as junior and senior year, I also did research during the school year with her and again between junior and senior year summer. Uh, and then after college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I kind of explored doing P PhD programs, but I couldn't really narrow down the specific way I wanted to go. Um, so I actually got a job at Genzyme, kind of through networking of a person that I knew. Uh, and it started out in cell culture manufacturing, which um, means that our company generates biologic drugs, and to make those, it, they're produced by cells. And to grow up the cells and give them different conditions to produce either the protein or the enzyme that treats the patients. So I did that for a year and it gave me really good industry experience just knowing how the company worked and what they were looking for. Um, a lot of industry is really good about documentation so if you think keeping lab notebooks in your classes right now is difficult, <laughs> wait until you actually get to the, um, a corporate job because they're much more um, interested in patent protection so it's all about recording everything you did. So it gave you a whole new um, experience in those terms. But after a year of doing that, I was ready to get back more to the research side of things. So I actually had applied for a job in my company that was doing gene therapy research. Um, so after a year, I switched over to gene therapy research, and that's where I've been for the past four years now. Um, and also, as I was going through my gene therapy research, I realized it is hard to progress after a certain point without a PhD in sciences. So I started to pursue an MBA because I wanted more of a global perspective on programs and have more of a global impact. So I'm almost done my MBA in hopes of more being like a global project leader for drug development programs to push them along our company. That's kind of a fabulous story. Yeah. And it isn't impossible to take place without PhD. It just definitely takes a lot of time and I'm kind of ready to move on to something more. But depending on where you go, there's plenty of opportunities without PhDs in research. So don't feel like you that great it's not you don't have to get one to be able to get a job in industry or anywhere. But I bet 
and that it wasn't an accident that the fact that you did undergraduate research yes. with viruses no. yep. probably did. Yep, that definitely was kind of what helped me. I think if I hadn't done that research with viruses um, undergrad, it wouldn't have really gotten my resume pulled apart from other people. Um, it would have been more difficult to uh, get that job. All right, so you so you met Sam, and I'm I'm just I'm going to uh, to go ahead and so that you can meet all of our panelists and um, and find out a little bit more of their programs, and then we can have have a, a, a little bit more of a of a question uh, a question and answer. Um, so uh, I'm not sure who would like to go first. Uh, so uh, Katie, maybe you could you could start. Sure, uh, and uh, uh, just introduce yourself and, and the program and uh, some information for the students. Sure. My, okay. Good. My name is Katie Spolidoro from Johnson & Wales University. I'm here to represent the Physician Assistant Program. We started it um, just a few years ago. We're actually enrolling our third <coughs> class right now. Um, so it's a two-year program, a 24-month program at the university. We have our first set of graduates who are getting ready to graduate. They're in their clinical year right now, um, participating with local hospitals, um, healthcare provider offices throughout the state. Um, and then, as I said, we're enrolling our third class right now. Um, I can go over some of the requirements. If people have more specific questions, you think that, that would be helpful? I, I, I do, and um, uh, I, I, think it, I think it would be helpful, and I know that some of the students had uh, some, some questions about, uh, just about what makes your program sure. unique. Okay. Uh, we are the first um, physician assistant program in the state of Rhode Island, so we're very proud of that. Um, the typical um, matriculating student in our program, um, we've had over a thousand applications, just to let you know. Um, it's a pretty competitive program. It's a brand new building in downtown Providence. Um, if anybody's familiar with the Knowledge District in the area, I know that um, anybody that you can down in that area, down by Brown, the hospitals were located right over there. Um, just to give you the demographics of our students, they actually come from all different states and from across the country. Um, the typical student, on average, our matriculating student has a GPA of a 3.5 overall and then a BCP of about a 3.4. That was for our second year class. Um, those statistics are all posted on our website as well, and I'd be happy to give you the link for that. Um, we are looking for, our minimum requirement is over a 3.0, so we're looking for students who have a 3-point average as a minimum 3.0, but as I said, they're matriculating a little on the higher side. Um, some of the prerequisites include mostly biology courses. We're looking for eight credits in biology um, as an undergraduate, chemistries, anatomies and physiologies, um, just a couple of Englishes and other prerequisites that you get in your undergraduate degree. Are the majority of students in your biology majors? Yeah. Um, yes, no, yes, no. So, so we've got, how many people are biology? Okay, so you've got a significant, that's pretty much the number one area that we're drawing from. We do draw from the chemistry area, sometimes psychology um, come to us with microbiology. It really just depends, depends on the area that you're coming from, the experience that you have, the direct patient care experience, your interest in the program. If you're a mission, mission match with our mission statement, if we think that you're a good fit for the university. Um, we have 24 spots for our first two classes. We'll be enrolling 36 students this year and ultimately we'll move up to 46 for the whole program. Great, so, so we, have, we have biology. What are some of the, um, the other majors that are represented? So I want to shout out marine bio. So we have marine bio. Okay, do we have, uh, um, do we have psychology? Do we have math, chem? Chem, yeah. Psych. And some psych, good, good, good. And public health. Excellent. I'm sorry, environmental? Yep. Okay, great. Great. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we, can, we can zip on back uh, uh, to this. Do you, um, do you find that students that, have, um, that are, uh, are successful tend to have certain characteristics? Uh, what, what, what they've done with their undergraduate years? Yeah, actually, um, we find that the majority of the students that enroll at the university are the ones that are selected to come in for an interview and from there are offered acceptance into our program. Um, we find that they have strong undergraduate backgrounds and strong direct patient care. So um, Dr. Bottomley, who's the director of the program, when we are reviewing files, he's very interested to 
see how heavy of a course load you can carry during your academic years, your undergraduate. Uh, sometimes we have students that come back to school maybe from a different major and are interested in the physician assistant program, uh, but they don't have those sciences lined up, a heavy science background, proving that you can take up to so many credits just in the sciences. That's definitely something that we're looking for and we find that those students are very successful at the university. Uh, you also have to have direct patient care. Our minimum is 250 hours to apply for the program, but on average our, our matriculating students have about 2,000 hours. So you have to be able to balance that um, into your um, total application as well. Some students are coming right from an undergraduate degree. Uh, the majority of students actually are out there accumulating their direct patient care once they graduate, so they take a gap year, and that's not anything to be afraid of. I know a lot of people see that as a negative, especially when you're in the undergraduate setting. But to be honest with you, going out into the real world and getting that seasoning, as they call it, and that experience is really something that is helpful with your application as well. And we find that a lot of our stronger applicants have that experience as well. What type of clinical experience do people normally have? Because I know that like quite a few people here have their EMT license. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would consider? Um, that's definitely desirable. Um, some, and that's definitely one that we point students towards. Um, CNAs, EMTs, a lot of times, ER techs, um, medical scribes, medical assistants who are working in the back of the house with the patients, not so much the front of the house. That's not the patient care, but that question comes up a lot. Um, those are some of the most desirable forms of patient care experience that we're looking for, and those are the most competitive. Volunteer work looks good, physician <coughs> work looks good as well. When you think about just the vast number of applications that are out there, and this is not just for our program, although we're very flattered to have so many applications. PA programs across the country, there's less than 200 right now, so it is, it is hard to have your application noticed, so you wanna make sure that you're filling your application and, and your experiences with, with the best that, and the most competitive as you can. Um, I read somewhere that um, some of the like, experience with like health um, care and the Peace Corps mm -hmm. can qualify as um, experience mm -hmm. and medical experience. If you're working with patients and you have, um, it's going to be a hands-on experience. A lot of times, um, you know, it's funny, somebody came through and they had experience working in surgery, but the patient was always unconscious and it really didn't qualify as patient care because the patient wasn't awake. And, and even though you're in the healthcare field, you really have to make sure that you're having that interaction with the patient and that you're gaining the experiences. So it's never black and white. There are always shades of gray in there. And just when you think you've got it, you really have to just make sure that as long as it's that patient, hands-on patient experience with the interactions, um, that it would qualify, but you could double check that with any counselor or programs that you're attending just to make sure. Because okay. it can be a little tricky at times. I also, um, sorry, I also have another question. Um, what, like, I have different kinds of physician's assistants. Does your program like, offer different kinds? Or? At this time, we don't have a, um, it's not a specialty program. But, um, we offer nine different rotations. Seven of them are required, and they'll cover all different areas, behavioral medicine, women's health, family medicine, um, surgical, and so on. And then we have two extra electives that you could either choose to go into one area, maybe you liked one area in particular, or you wanted to explore another area. Um, so it, we're not exactly um, into the specialty yet. We have our accreditation status. It's an ongoing thing. We have, um, we were provisionally accredited. That's what any new program can be accredited as until the, until the students graduate, pass their national boards, and then come back with the um, more more accreditation stuff that just keeps going. Um, until we actually have our accreditation continuing, which will be upcoming, um, we don't plan to have any additional specialty programs, but after that, we're gonna be looking into that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here so that we can also hear about the Rhode Island Free Clinic. And Barb and Ronnie, thank you for joining us. You could tell us a little bit about the, the clinic and then also sure. some things that the students will probably may not know about the clinic, but then also some opportunities. Sure, so I feel like almost everything that you just said is a perfect preface for me talking about the Free Clinic. So the free clinic is um, based in Providence, but it's a statewide volunteer-driven healthcare delivery model. So we have uh, a twofold mission, one to provide uh, comprehensive health services to uninsured adults who earn below 200% of the federal poverty level. So people who fall outside of the Affordable Care Act coverage, 
and also to serve as a training site for healthcare professionals. So um, a lot of the people power at the clinic are people who are in programs with our partner academic uh, collaborators. So we partner with 13 different programs, including the JWPA program for the site training and experiential component of those um, different programs. Um, so some of them are certificates, some of them are licensed, some of them are just experiential. So we have a full range of um, volunteer opportunities, uh, ranging from medical assistance to language interpreting, to um, medical recording, to uh, prescription assistance programs, so a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is, in addition to regular volunteerism, or deep volunteerism through um, internships, we also uh, have one of the largest teams of AmeriCorps VISTAs, you had mentioned the Peace Corps. So the AmeriCorps VISTA program, if you don't know about it, is the domestic Peace Corps. You serve for a year um, of volunteer service at an organization working to um, deal with uh, helping people get out of poverty. So with the <coughs> clinic, we have people serving as volunteer coordinators and working with our extensive um, volunteer team, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, a uh, full range of nutritionists, physicians, assistants, all kinds of different people. Um, and we also have, um, well, there, there's seven different positions, including um, a data analyst, so some of the things that we were talking about in terms of looking at more analytical skills. Um, so those, those AmeriCorps VISTA program spots um, are generally filled because the clinic is nationally competitive um, because we're a statewide comprehensive care place. It's not just like an urgent care facility or a walk-in clinic. Um, people go see a primary care doctor, they get labs and diagnostics, free primary, uh, primary and specialty care, free medicine through our partnership with CVS, and through wellness programs. So if you um, meet the eligibility guidelines, you go there and you get this comprehensive care for free. Um, so we're a national model and we're nationally competitive. So um, the, the AmeriCorps VISTA spots there are typically filled by people interested in medical school, public health. Um, they take that gap year at the clinic because they're not really sure exactly what they want to do. Um, and they find that interacting with the range of people at the clinic and people who are kind of in their same position sort of a year of exploration, um, it's been very helpful for them. Um, they've gone on to medical school, PA programs, uh, public health, and VA and PH programs. So it's a really great experience. Um, some of the AmeriCorps VISTA placement opportunities are in organizations where you might have like one or two people. At the clinic, there are seven positions, so there's a team, and the work that they do is the core of the role of the organization. Um, the clinic couldn't function without the AmeriCorps VISTA. So it's not like you're doing some thing that sounds good on paper, but you're actually like making copies over in the corner. You're actually working with some of the top, top docs and medical providers in the state. So, um, uh, so thank you for that uh -huh. preface about the importance of having that kind of experience, because that's kind of what we do. Um, and one of the reasons that the medical providers volunteer their time there um, is because they provide medical care in a way that they thought they would when they were going to medical school. It's unencumbered by payments because everybody received uh, free care, so there's no billing, there's no clock watching, there's no insurance reimbursement. All of that financial aspect of providing health care is eliminated. So those providers get to see people uh, and give them care uh, at a very kind of human level. So um, that is, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, organization to uh, volunteer at, to intern at, to be an AmeriCorps VISTA program member at, because there are very few places like that. Everybody there wants to be there. The patients, the volunteers, the providers, the interns. Um, we have a very small staff, I one of just a few people um, that kind of help keep it all going. Um, but, I, but I would reiterate that based on the experience of people who come to the clinic, and I've, I've been running the AmeriCorps program for the last five years, and we've had almost 50 AmeriCorps they're all really uh, remarkable people who are doing interesting things um, and the value that they all said that they uh, received from the clinic is pretty amazing. So whether it's um, 
clinic or someplace else, I would really encourage you to not think of that gap year as something to be afraid of, but to really kind of figure out and use that as a, as a, as a really good year um, to kind of strengthen and solidify whatever it is. Yeah, it, it actually has a name because so many people do utilize it and use, utilize it to figure out what they want to do, and sometimes you don't know what you want to do until you're doing it. And sometimes you say, aha, this is exactly what I want to do. And you say, wow, this is not what I thought it was going to be. But it's all good. It's all good. It's really important. Um, Marvin, I just wanted to also, um, uh, the idea of if, if you've got any um, confidence in language, the translation. Yep. Um, uh, Spanish so translation is a huge part of what we do. Yeah. Have the majority of New patients now are Spanish speaking. I would also like to um, share a story of one of our Roger Williams um, students who came, um, Neil, who was with us last year. Um, and he was amazing. And he didn't have a medical background, didn't have you know, public health interest. Um, he helped us doing some marketing, outreach, mm -hmm. fundraising, uh, development work. And so one of the things that we look for when we place people in either internships or volunteer positions or AmeriCorps positions is not only your, like, what's your major and what's your interest, but how are you as a human being and your analytical skills and, you know, how have you demonstrated initiative and flexibility? Like, have you worked with a team? Uh, because there's very few places where you can work completely independently. So, you know, we can talk more about that if you're interested. Those are the folks that go into the exam rooms with the patient. 
patients in whether it's a doctor or a nurse protective practitioner or a PA, whatever kind of provider, that they, you know, bury the recorder uh, into the electronic medical record of the conversation and all of the health data. So they get to be kind of a silent witness to those interactions and what they're really like. It's one thing to kind of think about what those are really like, but when you have a lot of experience with a lot of different people and a lot of different patients as a medical recorder, you get a pretty good idea of what those interactions and what those conversations are and what that's really like. Um, so it's one of the reasons, like I said, it's a, it's a very uh, competitive uh, volunteer spot in the clinic because a lot of people Do they do like emergency medical care? Nope. No, it's not um, it's not an urgent care or walk-in. Um, people have to meet eligibility requirements, income, residency, um, and if they meet those eligibility requirements, then they go um, become patients. Okay. So it's like going to a regular doctor's office. It's much more comprehensive than a regular doctor's office. Mm -hmm. But not uh, actually we out of the yard. <laughs> you mentioned that it's statewide. Is you have a, a focus in um, in Providence, mm -hmm. but do some of the providers practice yep. out the state? So and are the are the volunteers ever involved in that aspect? In that oh, that's a great question. So the the clinic is located in Providence, and the majority of activities happen at the clinic. But we also have a statewide physicians network of about a hundred. Doctors around the state where patients are seen yeah. in those uh, volunteer <coughs> doctors' offices. And then we coordinate all the ancillary care, the labs, and the tests, and the, uh, get them access to medicine, through CVS, and, uh, whatever other special care. But there isn't volunteer, there aren't volunteer opportunities uh, other than that the province. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you ever get to interact with like, the place I worked at briefly? We had the discovery team, which would, you said you worked with the bacteria that would produce the compounds that would go directly to the So did you get to go take a few steps back ever and see where it all went? <laughs> um, the not, so I was working like first the manufacturing part, and now more on the development side. So I was also the discovery, which is like the pure research side. I interact with the individuals over there. We talk a lot, but I don't actually go and work in that department, like that area, just because once you kind of have a job, you're kind of stuck in your, unless you transfer jobs, you don't necessarily go over and work in that area very frequently. But I definitely have a lot of interaction with the discovery side. That's, that's an interesting point, because when we think about when we think about biotech, we kind of have one idea. Um, so uh, you, you started in one area, and then yeah. within the company, you found out about something else and did, did some moving. Um, and yeah. then also, are they paying for your MBA? Yes, they're paying for my MBA. Um, so one of the things I didn't realize starting to design was how many opportunities there are within like a biotech company. Um, it ranges from starting out having an idea of maybe I can treat a disease this way all the way to pull out production and selling the drug. So anything you can think of in between, there's an opportunity for a job somewhere. And then also one of the nice things about working for this company, a lot of actual biotech companies will do this, is provide education assistance. So you can say that I want to pursue a degree and I'm doing an MBA because I want to kind of go into the program management side of stuff. But I know someone that's getting an environmental chemistry degree in my department for a master's, or someone just doing a biotech um, master's program. And it's really nice that they support the employees to continue their education and aren't just kind of pigeonholed into one avenue. And you, you know some other residents. Uh, yes, I actually, in my direct department, one girl, um, I worked with Michelle, she, I want to say she graduated maybe seven or eight years before I did. Uh, but there's probably five or six people off the top of my head that I know that had gone to Roger Williams and are now working at Genzyme, either in Boston or in Framingham. It's a great company, and there's a ton of stuff there. Do you still like work full time and then go to school mm -hmm. like at night? Yeah, so I'm doing my MBA through UMass Amherst, and I chose to do an online program just because I 
have a very active stuff after work. I have a lot of stuff I want to do. Um, so it was hard for me to narrow down like two nights a week I would go to class in addition to homework on top of that. Um, so doing an online program just allowed me the flexibility, it's kind of like all the commercials you hear on TV, do it anytime, anywhere. Um, but it's really convenient just because I am working full time and trying to fit it into my life and my schedule is a lot nicer than dedicating certain nights to it and then extra time on top of that for homework.
JWU uh, from the PA program. And, um, and we also have uh, from the Rhode Island Clinic, we have Marvin Ryan. The Rhode Island Clinic, sorry. Um, and, and so we've, we've just been introducing uh, the opportunities for students and talking about uh, having a, kind of a question and answer about what students can do best to prepare, what to check on your hours, you report everything. We're not um, necessarily asking for any kind of documentation. We could possibly go and check on it, but the hours are all self-reported. So we're looking, um, students report, it's, it's funny, some students will just report the most pertinent information and some will go all the way back to high school, and then you end up just pages and pages of um, experience. That might correlate, but a lot of times it doesn't when you're the waitress at Friendly's or <laughs> nothing to do with the field that you're going into. Customer service skills, yes, but maybe not for the direct patient care hours, but that is how we accumulate the information. We take our information from CASPA. Um, if any information is misreported, there are re repercussions and, and students' applications will be, they'll be, um, unfortunately, they'll be folded um, or suspended, flagged, and CASPA will send out messages to everybody. That's how we do it. Well, our, our approach is similar. It's, uh, that is provided in the application process. Uh, I think I would add that if you intend that you will be moving into that type of program, you need to start relatively early to accumulate that experience because you can't wait till the summer before and then uh, think that you can accumulate it in a, in a hurry. So um, I think most of us have advising um, processes on campus where it, if you identify you are interested in a PA program or pre-med, pre-med, whatever, then you will be advised not only the courses you need to take and the uh, various types of testing, but as well the special characteristics of each of the programs. And that way you can be well prepared. I would also just, <coughs> having Having looked at a lot, a lot, a lot of applications and resumes for a lot of different things, I would also just encourage you to do what you're curious about, what you love, and report what you are proud of. Because I think, you know, going to Roger Williams is about getting good grades, it's about becoming a well-rounded person so you can be thoughtful about leading a good life. And in the same way, when you go to think about what's in your future, if you want to get a job, you're limiting yourself. If you think about what excites me in the way that you talk about the exciting, like you did this and then that didn't quite work, so you did this. What are you curious about? What like, gets you jazzed in the morning? If you think about getting a job, you are going to get a job, and that is not going to be a good one. So, those kinds of interests and curiosities are absolutely reflected in whatever you're going to submit to anybody. And anybody can see through that. <laughs> That's true. Because if you try and pump it up with fluffy stuff, it's not going to work. If you talk about things that you care about, that you're interested in, that you're, that you're proud of, um, if, you, if you work with people and 
they're good people and you know <coughs> it's it's meaningful to you. you. Do things that are meaningful to you and stretch yourself to do those things that are meaningful because um, that's what's going to get you where you want to go. Um, not like get the grade and get the job because that's like you're all smart people. You can do that, but if you want to really like do it upright, you know, do it upright and then go for the things that, that make you excited. Okay. Thank you. That, that, this is all really great, um, great perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about Brian's program? I know you're, are you, um, I'm with you're, the, you're with the graduate school. Yes. And then, um, so, uh, we have several graduate several programs. graduate programs. So some of them are, are, are and new, and some and just yes, some, some of them are, are in our uh, graduate school of business, and uh, we have tax programs, and we also have the MBA, and we're very famous for those programs they, because they've been in place longer. But we also have graduate programs associated with the College of Arts and Sciences. And so we have a Master of Science in Global Environmental Studies, and we have a Master in Communication. And so the um, requirements for those two programs, of course, would then be different <coughs> from the ones for the business-oriented programs. But every we have uh, all of the programs, uh, the applications are, would be online, and you can find deep information about each of the programs from the Bryant main, main website. And you just a ask for graduate education and then you have, you can diverge into the direction that's of your own interest. Uh, but they're all, up, they're all uh, accessible from that one website. And so we're, we, um, we have an, uh, known, the students who are in the arts and sciences programs, which is more in my, um, I'm the coordinator for the MSGES, but the students in those programs are very excited and they are doing very well in their career paths. We've been, we've been very pleased with um, the programs and the quality of our students. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the GES site is Global Environmental Science. Global Environmental Studies. Studies. And uh, we wanted that program to have an international focus and we do have possibilities for uh, incorporating study abroad experiences at the, at the uh, master's level. We have uh, particularly good opportunities in China, very good connections for doing summer research, uh, semester long research, taking courses. So we have a number of uh, collegial relationships with universities in China. Would internships and research as undergraduates help in that, in, in, the, in the placement into that program? Well, especially in the, um, for the Master of Science in Global Environmental Studies, it is uh, a research degree, so you do complete a research project that is approximately one-third of the program, and you write a thesis that you defend. So if you've had research experience, it puts you on step ahead because you can do a more elaborate project and build on uh, the skills that you already have and work directly with a professor in that role. Hi. One of our advantages is that our classes at Bryant are on the small side, so you get, the, the plus is you get uh, maximum contact with uh, your professors and the other students in the courses. And the downside is you can't escape their attention. <laughs> so it's a very, it's the kind of program, if you're one of those people that just likes to jump in and thoroughly embrace what you're doing, um, they, those, that type of student does very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
question. Or I'm going to pick somebody. <clears throat> um, so I'm a marine bio major, but I just declared minors in public health and Spanish, so I'm kind of. Yeah, I'm all over the place. So I was interested looking at this specific panel because there are those different like areas that I'm looking into. And when you said that there was an opportunity, <coughs> I'm sorry, for um, language and public health is like, are those two separate things or would they be able to be incorporated together? They'd be together. So what kind of like? Genzyme also actually has um, like case workers that they look for bilingual um, people to actually go and speak with patients in Cambridge and other places, so it's definitely a cause to help. Yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, so the bilingual medical services liaison internship opportunity includes interpreting for patients during appointments in the exam room, counseling, or wellness programs, assist with interpreting at the front desk, um, translation of uh, information, Working with medical providers, so those are the kinds of things, and we, and we think about it as public health because the clinic um, serves people who are on the forefront of the most vulnerable population of the state. And so we are we are sort of the safety net for the safety net in terms of healthcare providers in Rhode Island. So that it doesn't you get to deal with all of those public health issues for vulnerable populations. Have another question. Um, I'm a double major in public health and Spanish, so um, <laughs> so that's something I'm definitely very interested in. Is that like a semester-long internship, year-long internship, summer internship? Kind of um, there are a variety of different ways that we can approach it. So I've never. Does someone else? Why? Why just now? Um, I am a marine bio major, but I actually last summer and the summer before I worked. Millennium Pharmaceuticals bought out by Takeda now. Yeah. So I got a lot of, in, I was actually in the discovery team. I worked on several assays that they were doing. I picked up some skills. So I was kind of interested to cool. see what yeah. Jen's on for. Yeah, we actually that. had a couple employees recently switch over to Takeda. So we lost some to you too. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's one of the things you notice a lot. And at least I'm in the Boston area, is a lot of employees do kind of jump from company to company just because there's so many experiences and opportunities out there. Like you don't just have to stick with one place. You see you, you like this and then maybe a year or two later you like that. And everyone understands that it's, it's business. It's just where it's been. No, we can like walk. Yeah. So that yeah, it's very competitive, especially in Cambridge, because there are 15, 20 biotech companies within like a two mile radius of each other. <laughs> just walk down the street and find a new one. <laughs> so you don't have to move when you get yeah. there. <laughs> walk your boss and stuff downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is an interesting perspective because in some places, you know, or, or maybe just you, know, you would think that that it would be it would be best to stay and, and work up. And I know that there are students that have graduated and gone to Genzyme and have stayed and moved within that company. Yeah. But but if you are if you are going different places and picking up new skills, you're you're still desirable. Yeah. Even if you might be a flight risk. <laughs> uh, but if you can lend your talent, so it, it's it's interesting. It's a very very different world. Yeah. Um, but uh, and, and you did say that Jen's like was hiring. We are hiring. Yeah. All sorts of jobs. It's a huge company that's financed as business, marketing, public relations. Pretty much every field that you could study, Jensen has some form of it. There's also a very good job potential in the environmental fields. It is one of the faster growing uh, realms and um, probably should be growing even faster given the challenges that we have, but um, there's good job potential there when, after you get to the place. I know we've got some environmental, um, or environmental meetings and And there's so many new coastal resiliency programs that if you, uh, those of you who are marine, in marine biology, you are going to be highly desirable. So because uh, everyone is recognizing the coast is changing fast and um, communities need to be ready. Um, there was just an article out this week that said if you don't want to address the issues, you should probably be thinking of moving <laughs> if you uh, reside in one of those areas. So, 
that's another big growing field. Teachers break. Teachers break. Teachers break. Okay, so how about someone else? Uh, why they chose this panel? We can, if that's a good discussion, come on. I think Rachel is just waiting to speak. Okay. <laughs> well, technically, I'm going to go into accounting, but I originally came to this math, and I'm my name. <laughs> so you need a lot of options too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think so. The the, the connection between um, being able to work with people, understand behavior and choices, and uh, have uh, you know skill in, in math, you can take a you know your disciplinary knowledge and your passion for the subjects, and then you can apply it to these complex problems. I think right now something that we're seeing more and more is the importance of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. So if you have training in one area and a passion in a couple of other places, you you can really tailor it in a way that I think is is, is, uh, is very special right now. All right, another. Well, I know a lot of you guys are talking about teamwork and stuff like that, and on our campus, clubs are really big, so e-boards and stuff. Are right, kind of the parts so would you consider that as something like going on as an ASR as your team works? So e, e board is, is your kind of your elected officials and leadership. I had put on my resume when I was applying for colleges because I was again on clubs like campus as well and you have done there. I, I don't think it'll hurt. It depends on what type of job you're looking for, but I think it's definitely beneficial to show that you were involved and that you were participating and were seen as someone people wanted to have in a position of power is the right word, but that they want to be their decision. Is it, is it something that you're truly active in and proud of? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely, definitely. 24-7, all day, all day. <laughs> Spending my time with Gary. One can hardly think of a field in today's world where teamwork is not used. And so those kind of skills that you, you know, especially in areas where you really were involved and you have enthusiasm about it. Yeah. As an employee, you really enjoy working with other employees that have similar skills. Because when you get alone in a room that you're trying to come to a common goal, it's really difficult when one person is sitting there and refuses to work with everybody else. And it makes a very <laughs> difficult environment. Should he want that person? Yeah. I, I think the flip side of that is if you have the same, if you have a bunch of people in the room and they're all exactly the same type of people, yeah. you're going to get a far less interesting outcome than if you have a lot of people who yeah. kind of a little wacky for each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the more kind of, the more rich the mix, the more rich the outcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so one of those skills is how do you interface when right. someone is gross, you know, greatly disagreeing with you, but they're both good ideas, and that process of working that out is um, very fruitful. And from the academic side, just just thinking about the, the students that are applying to our university, athletes, clubs, organizations, especially when you're participating on a higher level, just shows us that you actually have time management skills mm -hmm. that you can devote time aside to your studies, and you're doing very well, and then you balance the rest of your life as well, so it's definitely a positive. I saw someone come in with web development. Okay, so, <coughs> so important, <laughs> or really, you know, for a, a nonprofit, for a business, or, I mean, just, I, I don't want to, I, I wanted to, so just pull that in, because then there's a whole other layer of reaching people and outreach and um, connecting within and without. So, so it's a good other. Well, why don't we, can we please thank our panelists. <laughs>